welcome to Comic Tropes. I'm your host, Chris. Today, I want to talk to you about a comic book superhero from India named Nagraj. But before I dive into that, I also want to let you know that I have some new Comic Tropes merch. I designed this t-shirt, which can now be found if you're interested in the link. There's going to be also a thumbnail just below this video if you're watching it on YouTube. So please check that out. It celebrates comic books from all around the world. And speaking of comic books from around the world, I love reading all sorts of comics, including foreign comics. Sometimes you find something that you just fall in love with, and other times you can at least find something that's very different and wild and entertaining. That brings me to Nagraj, the first superhero comic from India. Nagraj is very interesting. We're going to dive into an utterly bonkers issue today where the publisher completely ignored copyright and instead just decided to use characters like Batman and Spider-Man. So let's get into that and then at the end I'm going to talk about where I think the publisher maybe made some missteps as well as recommending some good Indian comic books. Let's dive in. The first comic books in India started up later than in a lot of other countries, with Indrajal Comics publishing reprints of The Phantom, Rip Kirby, Mandrake, and more, beginning in the late 1960s. But the first original superhero in Indian comics was Nagraj in the mid-80s. Raj Comics founder Raj Kumar Gupta created the idea with his sons Manoj, Manish, and Sanjay. It was developed with the heavy influence of local snake legends like the Ichchadari Nag, shape-shifting cobras, and Vishmanusha, venomous human beings. Nagraj debuted in General Comics issue 14 by Raj Comics, by writer Parshuram Sharma and artist Pratap Moloch in April of 1986. Over the years, Nagraj's origin has become more complex with various retcons that involve him having royal lineage or connections to the snake deity Deva Kaljayi. Pardon my pronunciation, I'm kind of guessing on that one. Sorry, folks. Uh, anyway, originally, Nagraj was a lot more straightforward. He was raised by Professor Nagmani, who it turned out was evil and was using Nagraj as a weapon. Nagraj figured out very quickly, you know, what the real world was like. He wanted to become a force for good, and he operated with a secret identity as an employee at a TV station that he secretly owns. Today we're going to take a look at issue 220, which shows Nagraj punching the new villain of this issue, a small alien man who has infinite magical abilities. The splash page sets up the premise, but it honestly lacks energy. There's no background to establish the scene, and Superman, Batman, and Spider-Man are just standing around awkwardly in some sort of handcuffs while the evil wizard Shakura laughs. There's also some coloring errors, which are not insignificant, but I think technical errors can be overlooked in the early days of a comic's debut. What's harder to ignore are the titles for the heroes, and I do understand some of this comes from translation issues, but it's still fantastic. Superman is the protector of Metropolis, so it lulls you into a sense of normalcy. Then everything goes kind of crazy as Batman is named the Preserver of Gotham City, which makes it sound like he's a historian. And Spider-Man is referred to as the Mightiest, so don't get too full of yourself, Superman. Finally, the villain is named Shakura, and I have to admit that his look with no lips is suitably creepy. Now, did Raj Comics carefully work with both DC Comics and Marvel Comics to create this epic crossover? No, of course not. They just ignored copyright law. That said, not every country is going to follow copyright law the same as we do in the U.S. For instance, in Japan, it's really not uncommon for publishers to allow fans to create a small number of comics based on their characters, and they just treat that as a training camp or a future talent pool. We start the story proper on the planet Shakura, where everyone is also named Shakura, and we learn that all of them are both immortal and have magical powers. The villain Shakura is on trial and in captivity. A prosecutor explains that the villain did something off-panel that played with others' lives, so they intend to remove his powers, 
throw him off the planet, and to add insult to injury, quote, spoil his face. Jeez, just kill the guy. However, as soon as his people try to punish him, Shakura simply uses his powers to leave. He also uses his powers to paralyze everyone. So either some people on this planet have more power than others, or his captors were quite stupid. Probably the latter. If you had magical abilities to do everything, you'd probably get lazy and stupid. Meanwhile, Superman is chasing someone named Missile Man. Who is that? It's apparently a guy who has missiles and not a reject from a Mega Man game. And I say chasing, but the comic calls it hide and seek, which is quite playful. And maybe it is playful because the scale in this shot makes the buildings look more like toys that Missile Man is knocking over. Superman both wonders where Missile Man is going and comments on where Missile Man is headed. Ugh, where is he going? He's headed towards Worcester Bridge. That's a clue! However, Superman kind of sucks in this issue and he isn't fast enough to stop Missile Man from blowing up the bridge. Missile Man has a positive attitude about things, commenting that nothing can stop me today. Unfortunately for Missile Man, something can stop him. Superman's murderous rage. Superman just grabs the guy and flies to the nearest volcano, telling Missile Man he's going to make your grave there. And then Superman kills Missile Man in what I can only call director Zack Snyder's dream for the Man of Steel. And maybe I was too quick to assume that there were copyright violations, because on this page, not only is Clark Kent spelled with two Ks, the hero is also called Supperman. Perhaps this is just a big misunderstanding on my part, and this powerful fellow has a mission to enforce evening mealtime. At that moment, Shakura crashes to Earth in a diamond, which Superman opens. I suppose Shakura's powers must have their limitations, including having trouble opening the containers that he creates. Now that sounds like it would be trouble come dinner time. Fortunately, if you've created a container you can't open, this is a job for Supperman. Shakura introduces himself to Superman and gives him permission to call me only Shakura too. Gee, thanks. Then Shakura almost makes a tactical mistake by announcing out loud to Superman that he will imprison him. He attempts a fighting move, a flying headbutt that somehow doesn't break his neck. Nevertheless, Superman must have remembered this moment because he himself later tried to stop Doomsday with the similarly risky maneuver. Superman shrugs off the headbutt and dismisses Shakura with his super breath, or, as the comic calls it, a puff. Shakura finally stops trying to physically battle Superman and simply enslaves him in magical rings. And this actually makes sense. I'm not sure if the writer was actually trying to keep something about Superman accurate to the comics, because in the comics, one of Superman's few weaknesses is magic. However, that would probably be giving it too much credit, because keep in mind, we are 25% of the way into this comic, and we still haven't been introduced to the main character. Superman tells Shakura that there are other heroes that will stop him, and immediately rats out Batman and Spider-Man. The story cuts to Batman, who's shouting out his secret identity while swinging above the city. He is immediately imprisoned by Shakura, and is shown to be utterly useless. Then the story cuts to France for a Spider-Man introduction. The perspective on Spidey on the Eiffel Tower is pretty weird. It reminds me of the time J. Scott Campbell drew Spider-Man as being able to stretch out to two stories high. Why is Spider-Man having an adventure in France? Why not New York City, where he's from? Nagraj often traveled all around the world, so maybe the comic was just trying to show more of that. But then again, New York is just as foreign to India as Paris is, so I don't have a good answer here. I will say that in this scene, Spider-Man is defusing a bomb. And in the 1980 movie Superman 2, Superman saves the Eiffel Tower from a bomb. So maybe that was the inspiration here? Maybe? No matter, because Spider-Man is captured just as easily as Batman, and the bomb is also frozen with Spider-Man. In storytelling terms, introducing this bomb is an example of the playwright's term Chekhov's gun, which refers to the story structure suggesting that if in Act 1 you show that there's a weapon, by the final act that weapon has to be used. Let's see what happens in this comic. 
And here we go. On page 11 of 30, we get to see the title character, Nagraj. He's taken his girlfriend, Visarpi, to the circus. There he orders her to be quiet. For a character introduction, seeing the main character sitting down from behind is not the most exciting way to meet them. And the first thing he does is tell his girlfriend to pipe down. What a hero. Immediately, there's chaos as Shakura attacks the circus by using elephants. You'd think his magic stasis would work fine, but this time he uses hypnotized elephants. We're told the name of the elephant that Shakura rides on, but no offense to those of you in the audience who are elephants, but who cares? Speaking of names, we're also given the name of the ringmaster, which is Lou Albano? Lou Albano was a pro wrestling manager. He wore rubber bands in his beard. That was his thing. You might also remember him as Super Mario from the live action segments of the 80s TV show. But that's a very specific name. I doubt there's many other Lou Albanos out there. Well, this comic uses that name, which is a lot like naming your fictional character something like Nissan Altima. The story tells us that Nagraj, quote, smelled the danger, which I guess means the elephant took a huge crap. Nagraj runs in to stop the rampaging beast and is completely ineffective. In fact, he begins to get crushed. So what are Nagraj's superpowers? Well, they're actually quite extensive. First of all, he has thousands of tiny snakes living inside of him, and he can summon them whenever he wants. Uh, he can form them into things like ropes and parachutes. He has incredibly powerful venom if he bites someone. He can also use powerful hypnotism, and he can sometimes just break apart his body into millions of little snakes and then reform, which can make him intangible. So there's a lot of powers there, but sure enough, I guess super strength is not one of them. Personally, I think I'd be willing to trade one of those snake powers for the ability to have a little bit of strength, but that's just me. Ringmaster Lou Albano is able to knock the elephant back, and Nagraj shakes his hand very awkwardly to thank him for the help. Nagraj tries to explain that he could definitely have beaten the elephant if it was normal, and Albano is polite enough to not call him on his bullshit. Shakura jumps off the elephant with this fascinating sound effect. Do you think it's supposed to sound like cheese or chess? Either way, it's a very unique sound to make by jumping. Nagraj now uses one of his powers, summoning a snake rope and then trying to just strangle Shakura to death. Shakura summons a wooden ball cage to roll towards the knocked out Albano, and Nagraj jumps down to save him, kicking the cage to pieces. Inside are the various superheroes, which Nagraj acts like he knows. Batman seems to be radioactive. Shakura continues to spread chaos, and we're told that he burnt Vasarpi's feet. It's important to realize that the artist did not feel like a dramatic event like burning the superhero's girlfriend's feet was important enough to include on panel. Now, I'm not trying to get a big score on wiki feet or anything, but I think that that might have been worth including within the artwork. Shakura now sets the circus on fire, and Nagraj decides that the best course of action is to save the superheroes. I hope the circus guests have already escaped. Nagraj opts to put each hero on the tiny choo-choo train under the circus tent. Superman calls Nagraj dear, implying there's a lot more to their relationship that we don't get to see. Ooh! Keep in mind, the miniature train would not have train tracks leading outside the tent, so Nagraj moving them on it isn't very helpful and he only makes it a few feet before the circus tent begins to collapse and blocks the tracks. Nagraj is in trouble. He is trapped, and he is trying desperately to save some people from a fire. So how is he, as a superhero, going to save the day? He's at his lowest point right now. Is he going to make some sort of big sacrifice or try something risky to save lives? No, not at all. Nagraj simply kneels down and prays which summons Garuji, some deity with godlike powers. Garuji puts out the fire and frees the heroes, and heals Visarpi's feet. Nagraj is never really in any danger with the ability to summon this guy. 
And if American parents were getting mad at Superman comics for inspiring their kids to jump off the shed in an attempt to fly, what would that be like with Nagraj? Kids could be playing by a cliff or taunting wild animals as long as they thought that they could simply pray for salvation before anything bad happened. Then again, now that I think that through, it's entirely possible Indian children could be smarter than American kids. Shakura uses his magic again, but this time to grow Lou Albano into a giant who is filled with rage. Guruji puts out the fires, but he doesn't bother to help with this one. What a dick. So now Lou is evil, and he happily shouts out some nonsense, saying, Shakura Zindabad. The superheroes immediately focus on stopping the giant, but pretty much completely ignore the innocent bystanders, who are getting stepped on and crushed. Superman, who could have used his strength or heat vision or freeze breath, instead gets a gigantic nail from somewhere or other and cuts the giant's face a little bit. Not to be outdone by Superman's bad plan, Nagraj tries to bite the giant's back, but can't pierce the skin. So instead, he summons thousands of snakes and makes them go into Albano's mouth. Hmm. Gross. Remember the bomb Spider-Man diffused? Well, they attach it to Giant Lou Albano, and it does absolutely nothing at all. Glad we used some panels on that. Finally, Superman punches the giant who falls down, dead from the snakes in his guts. Nagraj brags about killing poor, innocent Lou Albano. Superman says he thought he killed Albano, and everybody laughs. These people are monsters. Oh, and what about Shakura? Apparently, Garuji took care of him off panel. We never get to see him stopped. It just stops being important while the superheroes all enjoy a nice meal together. Well, except for Spider-Man who doesn't take off his mask. And the issue wraps up with Nagraj telling the departing superheroes that he'll see them again in, quote, some delightful moments, which comes across much more creepy than I think he intended. And that's the story. Now, I understand that there's going to be some cultural elements that don't translate well, that we just don't understand. But I think that the story structure itself is very weird, because you've got a main character that's never really in any danger. He can always pray for magical help. That really reduces the stakes in any potential conflict. Nevertheless, Nagraj was actually quite popular through the 80s and 90s. Maybe not so much going into the 2000s. And I say this as an outsider, but I do think that one p possible issue there is the publisher, Raj Comics, was only printing the books in Hindi, which of course is the most common language in India, but it's not the only language. So if they had focused a little bit more on some potential translations, I think that they probably could have really expanded that audience. These days, superheroes are popular in India again, with original heroes showing up in movies like Krish and Raw One. In more recent years, Graphic India has published comic crossovers with Image and worked with mainstream Western talent like Grant Morrison and even Stan Lee. And graphic novels like Kari and Corridor have shown appeal beyond India's borders. Perhaps one day we'll see an official crossover with Nagraj and some American superheroes. Before we take off, let me just show you some fan art that came in this week, and then we'll wrap up the episode. Jake McLean illustrated me delivering a fatality to Sub-Zero. Gaten LaPrey drew Red Sonia, suggesting you direct your gaze towards my channel instead of at her. Michael Cortez created this cool portrait of me. Jim Couture has envisioned a mashup between me and Howard the Duck. You can see more of his work at his links. Not William sent in this cute little version of Infotron, my rarely seen sidekick. Michael Jansen made this Golden Age-esque cover, featuring myself and Infotron as the dynamic duo. Michael includes his social links. Gavin Rivera illustrated me as Omni-Man, so I guess I'm about to take Invincible to Subway for dinner. Gavin includes his Instagram. Finally, Caleb's song drew me into the cover of Spider-Man's first appearance. Caleb also includes his Instagram. Folks, if you would like to have some fan art featured on this channel, I'm always happy to do that, as long as it just has something to do with this channel. So if you want to do something like that, just send it into this email, comictropes at gmail.com. This week, for the final week, 
I am going to give away a random prize to one of these entrants. In the future, I'm just showing the art, no prizes. This is the last prize that I have, and I'm gonna phase that out, but let's see which of these lucky folks wins the prize this week. I'm going to draw a random ball out of the ball hopper, and it is, this time, number four. Number four was this art. Congratulations. Let's see what the final Gachapon prize is. That comes out of the Gachapon machine that was donated by Lunar Shines quite a while ago. So, let's see what we got here. I'm gonna just open this one last time. Doot, doot. All right. Ah, it's tough to get the last one out. There we go. Oh, and of course it's completely white, so I have Let's open it up just so that we can see for one time anyway what the prize inside is. Oh! <laughs> All right, I don't know how well you can see that. This is a uh, office lady, like some sort of like maybe, a, I don't know, just a businesswoman. But she's doing, um, I believe it's called Concho, which is like a Japanese game where you make your hands like this and try to stick your fingers up somebody else's butt. Normally I don't tell you what's coming up next, uh, it's a surprise, but this time I actually am going to tell you what I'm currently working on. I've been working on it at the same time as working on this episode, and it's, it's taking me a little while. Um, but um, there was news recently that the mangaka uh, Kentaro Miura passed away uh, unexpectedly. He was only 54. Um, he's the creator of a, a very long-running manga, Berserk. It's a book that I uh, discovered a few years ago, thanks honestly to um, viewers like yourselves. And I really fell for it. This has become a sincere favorite. So um, I definitely want to uh, discuss his work. I think it's, um, it's really amazing. Um, it's also huge, so that's very daunting. Uh, there's honestly no way I could just make a single episode about everything without it really being more of a documentary. But I think I can talk about like one arc, one of my favorite arcs, which is still a lot of books, and um, and just sort of go over what uh, Kentaro Miura did that was unique and special, because um, it, it is quite a unique uh, comic. It's really amazing. It's really cool. Um, didn't want to necessarily rush that out uh, right when he passed away, but it definitely provoked me to sort of move up my idea of I always wanted to do this. I'll go, I'm going to do it a little sooner. So just want you to know that's what's coming next. Um, if you haven't read it, I already recommend it. But next time you see me, you're going to know why. Anyway, thank you so much for uh, watching. It means a lot to me. Please remember to hit like and subscribe. Leave a comment down below, uh, especially if you've ever read any Indian comics. Let me know what Indian comic books you like. Uh, that would be very interesting, and that stuff helps the channel when you can comment like that. Until I see you next time, keep reading comics.